Welcome back to Monitors Unboxed for the unexpected part two of the Q&A series, uh, or Q&A session, I should say. I was originally planning to make one of these videos, but as I was scrolling through some of your questions, there were just so many good ones that I wanted to answer and respond to. So we're back with part two, which will have another whole section of uh, questions and answers for you. So without further ado, let's get into them. Jonah asks, in your video covering the response time charts, a few of them showed overshoot seemingly going past 255 on the middle chart. What is happening in that case? Does the monitor get brighter than what is normally possible? So this is a great question. This is one of those questions that shows that you guys are paying attention to the videos and looking very closely at those charts, which I'm really glad is happening. So yes, it is possible for a monitor to overshoot even when the transition is supposed to end 255. And the reason for that, so 255 being full white, if you're not familiar with the RGB scale. So um, the reason why this happens is that when you're calibrating the monitor, and we calibrate our monitor every single time before um, doing the performance numbers, so the response time numbers, when you're calibrating the monitor, you're not necessarily opening each LCD crystal fully to show a full white image. So for example, if you've got, let's say you've got a monitor, you've got it out of the box and it looks tinted quite blue and you want to adjust that tint so that uh, the monitor looks a more natural color temperature. So the monitor may ship with each LCD crystal being as open as possible to display full white, and that just may means the monitor looks a bit blue. Whereas then you go into the monitor settings, you calibrate it, and you may turn down the level of the red and green channels so that, or in this case, I guess I was talking about blue tints, so you turn down the blue channel, you might turn that down a bit to get to a more natural color temperature, which means that even though we're still measuring up to 255 full white, some of those crystals aren't gonna be fully open. They're being limited to show the correct color temperature, which means that when we're performing response time measurements and we're using a really high level of overshoot, what may be happening is that the monitor is actually transitioning up to the correct value and then overshooting it because we've tried to limit it a little bit to get the correct color temperature, going to a fully open LCD crystal and then dropping back down to the correct calibrated level. And that's where you'll see some overshoot occurring for monitors where we see overshoot part going past 255. So it is definitely possible. I've seen it many different times. What typically isn't possible is for the monitor to overshoot substantially because during the calibration process, you're probably only changing those gain values a small amount, which is probably only going to limit the LCD crystals a, a small amount. So you won't see as much overshoot as with other transitions. And of course you can't exceed what the actual backlight is capable of producing. So you're never gonna see crazy amounts of overshoot with those sorts of transitions. But due to the calibration process, due to the way that you can limit certain things when the monitor is displaying a full white image, yes, it is possible for overshoot to occur even with a full transition. Variable refresh rate slash G-Sync slash FreeSync range varies considerably between monitors with the low threshold being anywhere between 40 and 80 FPS or Hertz. Uh, this was highlighted in past monitor reviews, but is rarely mentioned in recent times. What changed? Is it less important now? Um, yeah, so generally speaking, it is less important now, and there's a few reasons for that. With most monitors these days, especially the monitors that we talk about, we're reviewing monitors that are higher refresh rate, so 144 hertz plus almost all of the time, which means that almost all of those products can benefit from low frame rate compensation. So what low frame rate compensation does is that when you're operating the monitor at a low refresh rate, it can simply duplicate frames into a higher refresh rate. So for example, if you're playing at 40 hertz, or 40 FPS, the monitor can simply run at 80 Hertz and display each 40 FPS frame twice. Uh, and the lower that you go, say at 20 FPS, at which you would expect it normally, the monitor to normally run at 20 Hertz, it would then just quadruple that to 80 Hertz again. So, so long as you've got at least a 2X range in terms of the monitor's Hertz capabilities. So let's say you've got a 120 Hertz monitor and the minimum refresh rate is 60 Hertz. So long as the refresh range is 60 to 120 Hertz or you know 60 to 144 Hertz or 48 to 144 Hertz, all of those, um, all of those minimum Hertz levels are gonna give you at least that 2X range, which means that low frame rate compensation can then be activated and effectively you end up with a zero hertz minimum refresh rate. It's not, the monitor isn't really running at zero hertz, but it's just using frame duplication technology, which is I think mostly run GPU side. Don't quote me on that, I'm not 100% sure on that, but 
basically that's how those particular things work. It used to be more of an issue back in the days where we had FreeSync monitors that were like 75 hertz or 60 hertz maximum refresh rate, because if you had 48 to 60 hertz, you can't use low frame rate compensation because let's say you're running at 36 FPS, how do you duplicate that into a monitor that can only go up to 60 hertz? It doesn't work. Uh, so yeah, it used to be a big issue back in the day when we had those more limited refresh rate monitors. These days, what we typically see is that high refresh rate monitors have a sufficiently low minimum refresh rate that we get the benefit of low frame rate compensation. It also used to be more of an issue previously when um, these sorts of technologies were first being established because a lot of monitors had kind of dodgy performance around that minimum refresh rate. So if you had a monitor that was running at, say, 48 to 144 hertz, you could get as low as like 50 hertz and then you'd start seeing like flickering and other issues right around that 48 to 50 hertz barrier when we were activating the, maybe low frame rate compensation was included, but as we were activating that, we were seeing a little bit of flickering or other issues around there, um, which then makes the minimum you know, more relevant because if you're seeing issues at that crossover point where LFC is being activated, then you'll want that minimum to be lower and lower and lower so that you're never having to actually use LFC. I found the vast majority of monitors that we're seeing today in 2022, 2021, even years prior to that, is that the way monitors are handling that crossover between running at the minimum refresh rate, then running back into the LFC range, most monitors handle that really well. There are some examples where that's not the case. So Again, we tend to punish those monitors in our reviews and call them out for flickering and all sorts of issues. But generally speaking, the way that we've got monitors set up today where we've got a large refresh rate uh, or a, a high maximum refresh rate, a sufficiently low minimum refresh rate, giving us at least that 2x barrier, low frame rate compensation, and being able to handle that minimum refresh rate quite well, means that we no longer really have to worry about these sort of minimum refresh rate boundaries, which is good because... Yeah, it used to be quite, a, I remember it being quite a painful discussion back in the early days of, of variable refresh rate when you see 48 to 60 hertz monitors that basically make FreeSync completely pointless. So yeah, not as much of an issue today, which I think is great. Is OLED burn-in still an issue for new gaming OLED monitors? Um, yeah, it definitely is. Uh, so there's no OLED technology that we've seen so far that is able to fully mitigate or claim no burn-in, you're still very likely to get burn-in at some point with OLED monitors. It just depends on your exact usage conditions, how long you're using it for, those sorts of things. So I certainly think for people buying an OLED monitor and specifically for gaming, uh, it depends on how much other stuff you're going to be doing with your monitor. If you're mostly gaming on it, I don't think you should worry too much about the burn-in of that particular monitor. But for example, if you wanted to run desktop apps, do productivity work, answer emails, you know, maybe watch a bunch of videos and have it split screened with a document that you're editing. All those sorts of things are likely to burn in your monitor over time. It's just a matter of how long it's going to be before that burn in occurs and what mitigation techniques are using like pixel shifting and other sorts of things, uh, dark mode, that sort of thing. So it's definitely something that you need to going to be aware of when buying gaming OLED monitors. Again, for gaming, don't worry about it. If you just planning on using your PC for playing games and even a little bit of productivity work. Like if you're sitting there browsing the web for 10 minutes before gaming or pausing your game, alt tabbing to look up a, a guide or chat with friends, I wouldn't worry about that stuff either. I don't think that's a really significant issue. I'm talking about more, you know, you're using your monitor for two to three hours of editing documents and then also two to three hours of playing a game every day. I think that's going to have an issue for you with burn in on that particular monitor. So yeah, something to be aware of. I don't think it's always a reason not to buy an OLED. I still would definitely prefer it for gaming today. I think it's a really good technology. And, you know, some monitors like the AW3423DW have three-year burn-in warranties, which, again, I'd, for that sort of monitor price, I'd probably hope the monitor would last for five to six years, if not longer. So, again, it's not... It, it, it's kind of a half measure, I guess. You get three years of peace of mind knowing that if you see burn-in, you'll be able to replace it. Um, but again, it is something to be aware of and something that is probably going to happen. It just is a matter of time of how much you're going to be using it. What do you think of the upcoming 500 hertz monitors? Well, I guess firstly, I haven't tested any 500 hertz monitors yet, so uh, it's hard to know exactly what I think. I do think that 500 hertz is going to be, it's going to be interesting because it, it will benefit some users. It's probably going to be a very niche thing. 
Uh, certainly most people were going to be perfectly fine with 240 hertz or 360 hertz monitors which are already on the market but even when I was using 360 hertz and I think I mentioned this in an earlier question uh, even when I was using 360 hertz I could notice that it was quite a substantial upgrade in terms of latency and smoothness versus like 144 hertz so 500 hertz I would expect to be quite a substantial upgrade for people who are on 144 hertz and possibly even 240 hertz monitors. So we're talking about a doubling of refresh rate, which is going to have quite a substantial improvement to latency as well. It's going to feel smoother. I expect that especially once you get used to using a 500 hertz panel that you'll be able to tell the difference versus something like 240 hertz. Uh, and typically speaking, when I've used monitors that do double the refresh rate over something else, then you can notice that. So I don't think it's like a totally useless feature where we're gonna see 500 hertz and it's gonna be like, oh no, that's not bringing me any benefit. But I do expect the benefits will mostly be for people who are playing really serious competitive games that can be run at over 500 FPS, things like uh, CSGO, Rainbow Six Siege on the lower settings, those sorts of games where, yeah, if you're using high end hardware, you can get over 500 FPS and you're gonna benefit from the latency and smoothness of those particular monitors. I'm not expecting them to be cheap though. So again, esports gamers may be paying a lot of money for those sorts of products. Maybe they're gonna be used in competitions. I'm not sure what the case will be there, um, but I'm certainly very interested to check them out and see how things like response times, motion clarity go, because I don't think that we've reached the limit of what can be done with things like 240 hertz. As we get closer and closer to a thousand hertz, especially with sample and hertz, sample and hold display, sorry, uh, we'll get better and better motion clarity where really we won't be seeing very much blur and we won't need to rely on things like backlight strobing technology. So I'll be very, I'm very keen to check that out when hopefully they come, not sure when they'll be available, but as soon as they are, we'll be sure to be testing them. Next question, I saw somewhere that monitor response times change with temperature. Could you elaborate or test that? Yeah, I definitely could test that. It'd probably be quite an interesting video for this monitor's unbox channel and something that I think would provide some valuable information for people, but definitely monitor performance in terms of response times do change depending on the temperature that the monitor is being run at. And that's not just ambient temperature, it's also the operating temperature of the monitor itself. So if you're in a particular ambient temperature, let's say 21 degrees, like what we test at, it's gonna take some period of time for the monitor to warm up to reach its steady state performance at that ambient temperature. So you can't just turn on the monitor and expect, if you, especially if it's been cold for quite some time, that it will immediately be giving you the best performance. Most monitors will take 30 minutes to an hour of warming up in that particular environment for you to get the best response time performance out of it. Some monitors I've seen take even longer than an hour to fully warm up in that sort of ambient conditions to give you the peak response time performance. And the reason I say best response time performance is that the warmer a monitor is, typically the faster it will run. So the faster it will be able to transition uh, between one transition, between one color, I should say, and another color. So uh, yeah, that does have some implications. It means that if you're running a monitor in higher ambient temperatures, like 30 degrees, for example, typically a monitor will run faster in terms of its response times, but at a given overdrive setting, you may start to see overshoot. So if we're testing at 21 degrees ambient, and then you're running it at 30 degrees, you may see overshoot that we're not reporting simply because it, you're running it in a higher ambient temperature. And you get the opposite when you go down to cooler ambient temperatures. So if you're running at 10 degrees, which again, as I said earlier, hopefully not too many people are gaming in a 10 degree room, but if you are, you're gonna see slower response times, you're gonna see less overshoot, you're probably gonna see a bit more blur and ghosting uh, in those sorts of conditions. It also depends on the panel backlight brightness uh, because the brighter the backlight is running, the more power it will be consuming, the more heat output you'll be getting, and that's also going to influence the speed of the transitions that you're seeing. So if you're running your monitor at a lower brightness level, it's probably going to be a little slower. If you're running at a higher brightness level, it's probably going to be a little faster than what we're showing at 200 nits, which is sort of middle to high uh, point for most monitors in terms of the brightness output there. So again, there's lots of considerations there, and it's why it's very important uh, when reviewing monitors to always test in the exact same conditions. So testing in the same ambient temperature and also testing at the same brightness level, because the brightness level will normalize the, well, it's not gonna normalize the power level because the backlight power consumption may be different between monitors, but it normalizes the, what you'll be seeing on the screen. So when we test every monitor at 200 nits in a 21 degree ambient room, 
The picture that you're seeing on the screen is hopefully exactly the same between every monitor because we've calibrated it and the brightness level is the same. And then the temperature is the same as well. So we can really compare apples to apples. If you're testing every monitor at the maximum brightness, as an example, then each monitor is going to be running at a different power consumption level because some monitors can really push brightness very high, like 500, 700 nits. The backlight's going to be really warm. That's going to have a significant impact on the performance. And then you've got some monitors that can't get very bright, which is going to mean that they're going to appear slower. Whereas for more normal usage conditions, a lot of people don't run their monitors at maximum brightness you may see that the performance is much closer because, again, when we're more normalizing for that factor. So, again, it is very important. I've seen monitors that even, you know, one to two degree differences can have a substantial impact on performance. For some monitors, it has a very minimal impact on performance, but, again, the temperature does still influence it. So, yeah. It is a very important part of testing monitors, getting the temperature right, controlling for temperature. It's just one of the many variables that we have to consider with testing monitors and something that, yeah, I guess you just learn through experience that it's an important thing and that you have to let monitors warm up. So we do it for every single review. I would dearly love to put the glory that is an OLED TV on my desk, but 42 inches is a bit much for my desk. How long before the technology arrives in a form factor that's more reasonably sized, say 32 inches, and at a reasonable budget, say around where 4K 144Hz panels are now? Well, uh, it's a bit of a tricky one to answer. We do have obviously the Alienware uh, QD OLED ultra wide, 34 inches. Again, it's not that much narrow in terms of its width compared to the LG OLED TV. You lose a bit of height, so maybe not the best substitute there, but it is more of a traditional or more normal monitor size compared to the 42 inches, which I agree is quite large. Um, the issue with you know, these smaller size panels is that a lot of what we're seeing today with OLED monitor sizes are off cuts from larger panels. So the QD OLED, for example, the 34 inch uh, ultra wide, that format is being used for QD OLED because when they're making those giant sheets of uh, panels at the display manufacturing facilities and they're cutting them to TV sizes like 65, 77 inches, the common sizes that we see, you end up at times with 34 inch ultra wide uh, sort of panels left over, which can then be made into these uh, QD OLED monitors that we're seeing. Now, I know that, that's a very rough example. I haven't got the exact numbers there. I know that there's some specific sizes that give you those 34 inch offcuts, uh, depending on the sizes that they're using at those factories. I don't have those exact numbers for you in this particular Q&A, but that's basically why we come out with those particular form factors. I think when it comes to the LG stuff with their TVs, obviously all their TVs are 4K, so they have to make different, uh, you know, different sheets for every single monitor that they're making, making it a little bit more dense for the 42 inch version compared to 48 and so on as you go up the sizes. Um, I think with the LG stuff, they're kind of, ex it feels to me like they're experimenting with the sales of the different sizes. So you start out at 48 inch, let's see how many gamers are interested in a smaller form factor. If there's a lot of interest there, maybe they can justify a 42 inch model. So potentially with this generation, they'll be getting good sales of 42 inch and maybe they'll justify them making a, a W OLED production line that goes down to a lower size. But on top of that, there's a lot of manufacturing considerations there because it's not just about, hey, let's go and make a 32 inch manufacturing facility for these panels. Maybe the way that they're manufacturing the panels uh, is not conducive for the pixel density required for 32 inches. Maybe they can't do it that way. Whereas other OLEDs are manufactured using inkjet technology, uh, which can have density implications in other ways. So again, it really depends on uh, how it's being manufactured and the sales that we're seeing. TVs typically are sold in higher volumes than high-end monitors. So that again, plays into all of these factors. You wouldn't want to start making a facility to produce 32 inch monitors if there's no demand for 32 inch monitors. And I think they're exploring all of those things. With all that stuff said about how, yeah, there's a lot of considerations with the current OLED manufacturers. I do think that we will be seeing more reasonably sized panels in the future. Uh, there's been some talk of LG producing a W OLED 27 inch. I believe it's 1440p. I don't think it's 4K, uh, but 27 inch 1440p OLED panel is, I believe, in production, or at least they're experimenting with that particular panel technology, which is going to give a much more reasonable size for uh, people to use. As for 32 inch, maybe that'll be happening. I've seen that there's some 
you know, there's other OLED manufacturers that are not just Samsung QD OLED and LGW OLED. There's all those other brands as well experimenting with OLED tech. And I think as we start getting more and more um, clear indications that people are willing to buy this, you know, it's all well and good for us enthusiasts to sit here saying we want OLED monitors and OLED monitors are going to go really well, but they're going to have to see, sort of see the sales volume. I think what we've seen from the LG TV side of things and also the, the Alienware QD OLED Ultrawide, that people are interested in buying them. You know, it's very difficult to buy those, the AW3423DW these days. It's sold out for many months. It's very high in demand. And hopefully that's sending a strong message to monitor manufacturers that the demand for those things is there to justify the panel development. And again, development for these things could take several years. So... Yeah, it's going to be a long road to seeing all of the different formats that we're used to today with 27-inch, 32-inch, maybe high, larger sizes, ultra-wides, different resolutions. It's going to take a long time for OLEDs to hit all those different categories, but I do think it'll happen and at more reasonable budgets because, again, we've sort of seen the 42-inch LG OLED or the 48-inch, sorry, LG C1 get down to below $1,000, which is very much 4K 144 its territory uh, on discounts and sales. So I think it's I think it's possible uh, that we'll see OLEDs below a thousand dollars in the next couple of years. But with all these things, it is a slow process, and we'll be there to test every single one of them as they come out because I'm super keen on testing more OLEDs. Does color calibrating a monitor change its pixel response time, and if yes, by how much? It's an interesting question to answer because there's kind of there's two ways to sort of approach this one. I think. The monitor performs the way it performs, so to speak. So no matter what you do in terms of changing the color values, the LCD layer itself has its inherent performance. It it can transition as fast as it can transition. So changing the color settings doesn't mean that the monitor is suddenly going to be faster or suddenly going to be slower. Uh, it's just going to be potentially limiting the range that the, you know, the transition actually has to take place over, uh, which of course can change the performance a little bit. But I think generally the way that I would think about this is that no, changing color calibrating a monitor isn't going to change the properties of the LCD layer to make it operate faster. It's gonna operate in the same way. However, color calibrating is important because it's gonna change the transitions that you're seeing, which are requested by the, the GPU, for example. So. An uncalibrated monitor, let's say you're trying to run let's like a 20 to 100 RGB transition. Now, if you've got an uncalibrated monitor, you may not actually be seeing the 20 to 100 transition when you're requesting from your GPU. The GPU is going, oh, you know, here display, show me this 20 to 100 transition. Your display may actually be showing something like 25 to 95 instead of 20 to 100. And that's because it's uncalibrated. It's got the wrong gamma performance, which means that you might see slightly different transitions actually taking place. So as we've shown many times in our reviews, each different transition, each different color that we're trying to transition from one to another tends to have a different level of performance. So if we're trying to measure 20 to 100 and we're actually seeing 25 to 95, we're not really measuring the 20 to 100 performance of the monitor. We're measuring 25 to 95 because it's uncalibrated. So when we calibrate it, we then are actually getting the real 20 to 100 uh, performance. So when we calibrate a monitor and we then run our performance tools, the performance numbers do change because we're no longer getting, we're no longer measuring the wrong transitions effectively. We're measuring now the right transitions, which are going to have performance implications. But it's not really the panel changing its performance. It's, we're not making the panel run faster or slower. We're just more accurately measuring the exact thing that we should be measuring. So I guess that's how I would kind of explain color calibrating a monitor affecting pixel response times. No, it isn't changing uh, the performance of the LCD layer, but yes, the measurement values that you're getting will be different uh, because you're actually measuring the transitions more accurately, you're more uh, closely matching what you should be getting to what you're measuring. So I guess that's how I would explain that one. Not a lot of things can change uh, the LCD performance outside of adjusting the overdrive settings. So that tends to be what I would expect. So even things like changing the brightness tends not to affect uh, transition times too much apart from the temperature side of things, uh, you know, changing the RGB settings, changing contrast settings. Again, that doesn't make the LCD layer run fast most of the time, uh, but obviously calibrating it is going to change uh, the, the accuracy of those measurements again. So yeah, that's pretty much that one. 
All right, and that does it for this month's Q&A series. As I said, I was only expecting to make one of these videos, but we had an hour of questions and answers. So I figured let's make two videos out of this one. Why not? Let's give you guys some extra content because you guys uh, uh, asked me so many great questions. So if you did miss part one, that is on the Monitors Unbox channel, probably, I don't know, a week prior to this or something like that. So do check back and hopefully watch that video, get some more great questions and answers. Uh, we also had uh, the original Monitors Unbox Q&A series back on uh, a couple of months ago that you can check out if you want even more feedback like this. So yeah, we'll continue to gather your questions from the Discord community, from YouTube, all sorts of great places like that. And I really appreciate everyone that's been supporting the channel so far. So yeah, if you wanna support the channel directly and also Hardware Unboxed, then we do have our Patreon float plan. Links to that and they're in the description below. We'll have lots more Monitors Unboxed content for you coming out shortly. Lots of great topics that we wanna cover. So yeah. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.